introduce Sally Brockwell speaking for her to the <laughs> So, yeah, I'm just like found out about this about five minutes ago, so yeah, <laughs> bear with me. So, before I turn to the primary subject of my presentation today, I want to recall a personal encounter that I had during a recent visit to Central Australia. I was walking through Trofina Gorge, one of the many spectacular geological formations that exist in the landscape of Central Australia. Unlike the majority of tourists and travellers who do, do a short walk up the gorge then leave, I took my time wandering up the creek bed, pausing to draw, take photographs and just sit and relax. One place in particular beckoned me and so I climbed up onto the rocks and nestled comfortably in between two gum trees. I was sitting there just talking to my partner for a while when I noticed that I had been unconsciously scratching away at the bark of a young gum with my fingernail. When I realised what I was doing, the relationship between graffiti and idleness suddenly became corporeally clear to me. I had always taken this association to be somewhat disparaging value judgment, a dismissal of the time, risk and commitment that is often invested in making graffiti. But in that moment, it felt as though a, as a gesture and a direct bodily engagement between me and my immediate surroundings, the link between idle hands and graffiti seemed to make sense. With the time to pause and dwell comes the capacity and desire to engage with a place sensorially. What seemed especially bizarre for me was that I then noticed someone else had also lightly carved a word in the adjacent tree branch. My reason for beginning with this anecdote is not to demonstrate how graffiti is pervasive and that it is done for any manner of reasons, but because I think it is important to think about how we encounter and receive graffiti, and also because I want to entertain the possibility that some places invite this kind of physical interaction. On that note, I want to turn to the focus <clears> of my paper and a historic landscape that is very much made by the marks people left there. The place I want to discuss is an historic quarantine station located in Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. First gazetted in 1832, the North Head Quarantine Ground was a place made for managing and curtailing the spread and effects of disease into the colony of New South Wales. Over the course of its 150 history, year history, smallpox, bubonic plague and pneumonic influenza proved to be its chief concerns, although the facility was presented with many other diseases, including scarlet fever, typhoid, cholera and dengue fever. By the middle of the 20th century, medical technologies and knowledge had changed considerably and quarantine events were far less common. And as a federal institution, the site became used for other purposes, including a detention centre for visa overstays and emergency shelter facilities. More than 13,000 people passed through the quarantine station over the course of its 150 year history and more than 500 people died there. But if we go back to some three years into its operation, the quarantine station played host to passengers on the ship, the Canton, after concerns were raised about smallpox. Little detail is known of this particular quarantine event, but at some point a young man named John Dawson scaled the cliffs adjacent to Spring Cove and carved a message into the soft Hawkesbury sandstone. Jay Dawson landed here to perform quarantine on the 11th of September AD 1835 with his wife Emily, five sons and three daughters from Lincolnshire on the ship of London in the region of, of Britain and Ireland. Dawson's message may be read as a marking of individual presence in the vein of an I was here decorative <laughs> statement, but to my mind it is also an extension of his diarising tendencies. After three months of sailing to Australia with his family, and detailing the voyage in his shipboard journal, John ended his story <coughs> with a poignant reflection on life and death seen here. John Dawson's graffiti, written on behalf of his family just three days after their arrival, firmly draws, draws the journey to a close. The inscription is the final punctuation marking the voyage's end, but at the same time it begins a new chapter, writ firmly into the land of their new home. 
Dawson's text, today almost indiscernible, is the earliest known example of over 1,500 different traces made in the quarantine station landscape. These inscriptions are the focus of a three-year Australian Research Council funded linkage project, combining historical and archaeological methods to map, analyse and flesh out the stories behind the sandstone. The land usurped to create this colonial institution of disease control is today regarded as part of the country of the Katagal Aboriginal people, and it is important to note that Aboriginal peoples of the area suffered greatly as a result of these diseases brought by the early colonists. In their volume on ancient graffiti, Baird and Taylor make a compelling and salient point about the problems of projecting contemporary values relating to graffiti onto the archaeological record of past graffiti activities. But in the context of this site's deeper Indigenous history, it may well be appropriate appropriate to think of non-Indigenous inscriptions in the light of contemporary definitions as unauthorised or unsanctioned behaviour. That is, if we consider these marks in the context of Katagal custodianship, the non-Indigenous immigrants, settlers, travellers and ship's crew were writing in a place where they had no authority to do so. And so, although the history and archaeology of the pre-quarantine station period is not within the scope of this project, it is important to point out that the mar marking of and into this landscape did not begin with the British occupation of Australia. To give you some indication of the physical landscape in which the graffiti is located, North Head Quarantine Station is located at the entrance to Sydney Harbour, flanked by steep rocky cliffs and stone walls along one perimeter, together with bushland, coastal waters, waters, seabeds and the beaches of Spring Cove and Store Beach. While predomin predominantly occurring in the naturally outcropping sandstone as paintings and carvings, graffiti also appears on slate drain covers, trees and on building walls. Much of the assemblage is carved, though there are examples of painted graffiti and some inscriptions incorporate both techniques. There are also many foreign language inscriptions, including Chinese, Greek, Russian, Arabic, and some as yet indiscernible script. If anyone has any ideas on this, we would be very pleased to know. <laughs> many of the inscriptions spread across the site Many of the inscriptions spread across the site consist simply of a set of initials or a name and date carved into the rough surface of a sandstone boulder. There are many others that stand testament to the professional skills of stonemasons and sculptors. These more formal inscriptions are often quite large, a metre wide or high, carved in bas relief onto a dressed surface, framed by a border with a company flag or insignia and accompanied by several lines of neatly engraved text. In terms of the graffiti content, they form a record of ports of departures, dates of arrivals, of shipping lines and their vessels, of the prevailing social orders at sea and on land, of familial ties and friendships and workplace associations. There are also inscriptions made in biro and pencil during the 1960s and 70s. In addition to recording names and places, the content of these inscriptions is sometimes personal and reflective of in individual detention circumstances. By the end of the 19th century, colonists had already begun to envisage these graffiti as part of a local tradition, with the very presence of the inscription becoming a visual proof of colonial ownership and history. Thus, not only were these graffiti used to build a sense of settler belonging in the new country, but visual and textual accounts emerge as a kind of historiography. This image of engineers from the RMS Australia posing with a fre freshly carved inscription offers one example. <coughs> Another comes in the form of diary excerpts such as that of Arthur Livingstone's. I went ashore on the quarantine station in the afternoon and had a splendid view of the harbour. Went through some of the quarters. They are clean and comfortable to look at. 
went up on the cliffs at the North Head and on the sandstone rocks that are there are several designs of house flags and ships' names that have been there. Some are painted in different colours, nicely carved and look very well. The Ching Tu has been there twice previous to this one. There is a cemetery on the ocean side of the hill. As further indication of how this graffiti became an ongoing and legitimised practice, there are anecdotal accounts of quarantine station staff refreshing the paint on some of the inscriptions, almost as though it were an extension of their duty of care. We also know that quarantine station staff were among those who added to the assemblage. L.J. Coglan, the telegraph operator on site during the 1880s, left at least three instances of his name on the rocks. In other words, <coughs> there was a clear recognition <coughs> that graffiti was a cultural tradition of the institution and had become a key element of the place in its history. But by the time the station closed in 1982, another legacy had developed and that emerged in the form of a distinction in the way the assemblage was spoken and written about. I have yet to trace the precise origin of this tendency, but by the 1990s, a language had developed which bifurcated the, the assemblage into two camps. There were the inscriptions associated with the quarantine history and the graffiti associated with the detention centre. There are a number of differences in both the formal and technical qualities of these two phases of graffiti production as well as differences in the social <clears throat> and physical conditions surrounding their execution. So under some circumstances, these differences war warrant discussion, but more generally we see this distinction as a legacy of language that encodes some value judgment. The project has sought to overcome this distinction by recording every form of mark making we can find in equal measure. Interpretive signage on site is also making the linkage between historic inscription and contemporary graffiti more obvious to visitors. Preliminary analysis of the graffiti assemblage suggests, perhaps unsurprisingly, that peak periods of inscription correspond with peaks in the occupation of the site during outbreaks of smallpox plague and pneumonic influenza. What is more surprising, however, is the paucity of inscriptions mentioning disease, death and vaccination. In a site where such concerns were ever present, this is a compelling omission and raises the prospect of graffiti as distraction and strategic amnesia from the spectre of death. Other motivations include graffiti as a dedication or expression of gratitude, such as a shield made in honour of nurse Effie Hargraves for attention to flu victims immediately after the war. Some of the graffiti operate mutually as a poem and a warning, advising the reader of smallpox suffering and its desire to never have left China. Other inscriptions carry a monumental character and appear to have been made to commemorate a particular voyage and its occupants. One inscription, located atop Old Man's Hat overlooking the harbour, appears as a self-inscribed epitaph or memorial to Edmund Thurlow, who died a few days after it was carved. In summary, by looking at the assemblage as a collective, a landscape of graffiti, we find parallels in motivation, form and content, content within a context of diversity. These inscriptions effectively operate as signs of life made by those who survived the voyage to Sydney and the quarantine or detention experiences that followed. Yet as commemorative gestures of passage, collective identity and individual biography, they also enfold places and people left behind.